suggestion method from the use of extracorporeal radiotherapy to pasteurization and now to the use of liquid nitrogen to sterilize the grafts. Use of aloe grafts have also been explored immensely, sometimes used as intercalary graft, sometimes in osteoarticular fashion, and lately as aloe graft prosthetic complex. Now, without any further delay, let's hear to the contribution and innovations of our experienced guest speakers. I would like to invite our first guest speaker, Professor Kang Hun Gai, for the presentation. Sir, so I'll just make uh, Professor Kang the presenter now. Over to you, Professor Kang. Yeah, I'm here. One second, sir, I'll make you the presenter. Okay. Yes, okay. I'll just introduce you again, Professor Kang. Professor Kang is currently the head of Center for Rare Cancer Center in National Cancer Center located in South Korea. He currently serves as the Vice President of Korean Society of 3D Printing in Medicine. He is the editor of Korean Orthopedic Association and an executive board member of Korean Musculoskeletal Tumor Society. Dr. Kang writes and lectures extensively on the issues of 3D printing applications in bone cancer surgery, both nationally and internationally. As orthopedic oncology surgeon, Dr. Kang continues to perform patient-specific 3D bone reconstruction, thus delivering the best functional results to the patient. Over to you, Professor Kang. You can start with your presentation now. Oh. Um, wait. So, I slide it. Yes, sir, we can see your screen share. Okay. Um, can you see it? Yes, sir. You, we yeah. can see you. Yeah. So then I start. Hello, yes. everyone. Um, thank you for being able to get to know each other through webinar today on Independence Day in India and Korea. In fact, I was surprised that two countries Independence Day was the same day. Um, 2008, since 2008, you will be much achieved the best to palliate your percutaneous surgical care of metastasis bone cancer. I made a unique screw and nail for percutaneous fixation and simultaneous bone cement injection. We published the 10 necessary journal of our digital clinical outcomes. I think we'll have an opportunity to share of these methods in the future. Yes, today's story is uh, 3D printing in bone tumor surgery. Recently, um, corona pandemic situation, you may see a 3D printing technology. Yeah. Look at this 3D printing. Respiratory valve and face guard, even container. My first uh, case started 2016. 23 years old, um, a man, young man had a calcaneal tumor. I designed the constructing manufacturers, including mechanical stability, post-operative wound problem, future adjacent sub uh, subtalar arthritis. He was in Air Force military duty service at the time. Yes, Korea had a mandatory uh, military service period of about two or three years. 3D printing calcaneal reconstruction was successful. The Korean FDA approved the 3D printed hospital implant just before this case. However, it can be used to one's and the entire area from 2014 in Korea. 
When the choice limb surface surgery than amputation, we have to reconstruct the bone defect area. Tumor process is the most common used method. We have just one company product from Germany. Uh, even that, only major joints are possible, and there is nothing imported for growing children. All tumor graft and elbow graft are also frequently used method. As you know, uh, rim survey surgery had really many restrictions and complications with the long operation time. Can you see my feet, a bloody feet, and my child appearance? As you know, this is a pastoral autograph. It's a uh, reusing method. Tumor burn soaking in 65 degrees water for 30 minutes and refix it. The problem is too weak. The other graft should be selected similar size, need shaping by hand and metal fixation. It also, it also time consuming procedure and too weak in the end. The pelvis is the most good indication of a 3D printing surgery. She has been suffering from bilateral breast cancer and left hip sarcoma during over two, 20 years. She had no breast on both sides, so she hoped to keep her leg in this time. Actually, I recommend the amputation several times. Um, yes, uh, there are many considerations to optimize the 3D printing output for each patient. Fixation with ilium, totally curved conjugation, and so on. 3D printing pelvis hybrid with the totally process and female allograft. At this first pelvic case, I realized the difficult to cover assembly at a small operation field. And also it was time consuming to connect with the iliac bone using a long screw. So next case, I designed the 3D acetabulum as exactly the same square holes of a 50 millimeter real acetabular cup. It made much reduced surgical time because we could pre-assemble it outside of a field during the surgical approaching. The 3D implant weight is much reduced with the mesh style body. Look at this transmitter light through mesh body. This is ischium. It does not roll in weight bearing, so we omit ischium. In this case, we also omitted the pubis and body has a reaches to deepen of a cup screws hole. The original cup screws, 16, 20, 25 millimeter, we can be used without heraclis cutting. In the periastabular tumor, 3D printing implant design with a gap for bone cementing. It will make it easier when we need attaching a stubble cup in the future. The 3D printing pelvic spacer can be fixed with just bone cementing without the screw fixation. We can cut out like a cavity, cavitary resection without navigation or x-ray fluoroscopy and also custom-made cavitary reconstruction easily by 3D printing technology. We can much transform the original bone shape for reduced complication and better function outcome. Like this downside iliac crest,
Up to now, there was no special way to reconstruct the external genitalia pubis without complication. The 3D printing pubis prevent herniation, and maintain the sexual activity, and enjoy favorite sports. This is a stable reinforcement ring. It did not fit to patient and made worse the upset society of irritation, eventually bad reading. The 3D stabula reinforcement curve was the good solution. Yes, our hospital oncology team is like a family. Um, the scapula is also a good indication like a pelvis. The KFDA does not yet approve 3D printing articular surface on major joint. Therefore, we should combine with a total shoulder arthroplastic. I designed it to enable both surgical method, conventional or reverse shoulder arthroplasty by depending on the assembly pieces. I have been trying to reconstruct the humerus in children with these many different methods. Process uh, cement, process allograft, I am nailing, also article allograft, and I am nailing, and bone cement. Now 3D printing humerus is available. So far, the available metal print out uh, print output is limited to 20 centimeter in length. So processes joint and 3D printing body combination was needed. This is mutual proximal humerus and 3D printing implant combination. Previously, partial elbow joint was reconstructed with an osteoarthrograft, but it had been destroyed. 3D printing partial elbow joint implant was successful. 3D printing form was born, reconstruction was attempted. In this patient, we had to remove of 3D ola due to local occurrence. And this, is, this patient is a fibromatosis patient. You may see surrounding soft tissues firmly attached the meshed bone contact surface showed the advantages for bone integration. His second surgery was a failure due to insufficiency fixation. I designed the 3D printing connector between the 3D radius distally and a lab bone proximally. It was designed in a functional posture to write. The 3D printing segment of female looks stronger than allograft, and we con conjugate it with the intramedullary nail for more stable embryation. Two-piece server 3D printing cortical mesh makes easy application, good soft tissue addition, and prompting uh, cortical bone breaching in the female self shaft surgery. These 3D printing custom-made plates are useful in some areas like adjacent knee joint. This is a fibrous dysplasia patient who has a severe bone death point and pathological fracture. Using 3D printing guide and implant, the angulation, rotation deformity, and leg length discrepancy were all successfully correct at once. Look at this chondrocytoma patient. She never touched her left heel uh, by 10 cm longer right leg and had a big tumor on the right femur. 3D printing segment of femur process was designed to correct the leg length and knee joint saving. 
In this patient, the metabolic leakage occurred during the exercise. But it looks like uh, detached between the implant body and plate. Yeah. Uh, then shock breakage. Uh, looks like detached. Stable fixation could not be possible with the conventional plate and cable wires. So this is a uh, um, 3D printing connector between the 3D printing processes and remain the femoral bone. Successful surgery, key for knee joint and correct varus deformity angulation. This patient had a pelvic surgery with the uh, uh, saddle process 20 years ago and showed the process aboard the migration and difficult to hip flex the sit down. 3D printing revision implant made him good working with the restoration of hip motion. The allograft pelvis eventually breakage, osteoarthritis, and hip dislocation occurred. The 3D printing implant is designed in two blocks. The block selectively used according to the surgical field situation. Um, by the car accident uh, over two years ago, this patient had 20 times hospitalization and 11 times operation. The left pelvis had five times surgery, but she could not walk and heard that there was no muscle anymore by hip surgeon. Not tumor, but she came to her National Cancer Center and our 3D printing experience helped her walk again and go back to the job. Not only in 3D implant, we proved the usefulness of a 3D printing tumor resection guide and 3D printing allograft shaping guide as well. 3D printing is a convergent study, many uh, process. So we need a code collaboration with each professional team. So far, we have published eight clinical and research, research papers. This is a 13 year old male who received a biopsy for pathologic fracture tibia at the regional hospital and transferred to me and diagnosed with um, adamantinoma. I had the surgery with a 3D printing implant within just one week of visit. 3D printing implants are now becoming one of the methods of limb salvage surgery. Um, 2000, oh, 2018 is a misprinting. Dr. Himanj, and Dr. Himanj managed Abichet speakers, and Dr. Vivek, um, Dr. Yongsung, Dr. Jamin, panelist, Dr. Ramwan, Dr. Kranti, coordinator. I'm so happy to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. It's a really nice presentation which you've given to us. We would like to take questions for Professor presentation where we have the session with the discussion with our uh, panelist. So now I would like to invite our second guest speaker, uh, Dr. Manish Pruthi, who heads the Department of Orthopedic Oncology at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Hospital in Delhi. Dr. Manish, I make you the presenter right now uh, and then you can share the PPTs. Uh, sir, can you share the presentation, sir, now? Just let me check. Yeah. Uh, so I give yeah. you give a brief introduction of you as well to the attendees which are attending our webinar today. Dr. Manu, it's the Department of Orthopedic Oncology at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Hospital in Delhi. He has more than 14 years of experience in this specialty. 
and has worked at many reputed hospitals in the country. He has worked as a fellow in orthopedic oncology department of Tata Memorial Hospital for two years. He has more than 2,000 major orthopedic surgeries in his career, which includes challenging trauma cases, major trauma resections, management of bone infection, and non-unions. This includes international patients from Asia as well as from Africa. Over to you, Dr. Hmm. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Himanshu, for inviting me and for a nice introduction. And happy Independence Day to all the participants and to the Korean uh, team that is with us today. So, as Dr. Kang has already mentioned, like many of the times, we need to think beyond us mega prosthesis in orthopedic oncology because many of the scenarios, the conventional mega prosthesis is not possible, maybe because of an age or because of the location or the tumor tendable bone or some different construction. And I want to share the outcomes of these interesting reconstructions. So I'll be starting with the first case now. This was a 25 years female. She had a pain and swelling in the left ankle for two months. She had an uh, heart swelling on around the lower end of a fibula. Someone did an FNA outside which was suggestive of an anaplastic sarcoma. And then she came to us. And we can see the X-ray, which was completely lytic lesion in the lower end of a fibula. MRI was suggestive of an expansile lesion with multiple fluid levels, lot of cystic areas and heterogeneous enhancement. So we did a core needle biopsy and the biopsy was suggestive of an high grade undifferentiated sarcoma. It was not osteosarcoma as far as the initial pathology goes. So we discussed we did a staging workup. Uh, our med medical oncologist asked for a PET CT, which was suggestive of non metastatic disease. And we did a tumor board discussion, and she was planned for chemotherapy based on the standard osteosarcoma 3 duct protocol. Although our medical oncologist uh, used epirubicin in place of atriamycin here. And we gave two cycles of NACT because he was not very uh, uh, very much sure how much chemotherapy is going to work. But yes, even, the, even in the X ray didn't show much healing in the lesion, the MRI post chemotherapy showed a little shrinkage of the lesion, but the tumor was still very cystic and it's still not ossified, but yes, definitely the soft tissue component was reduced. So the plan is very clear here that we need to resect the lower end fibula, but the question is how to reconstruct lower end of fibula because it is a very important stabilizer of the ankle. So we all know people have tried various methods. People have used a non-biological methods like a proline mesh uh, suturing uh, with the screws to the tibia and to the talus. But usually with the mesh, the, it can fail or it can loosen and give some laxity, which will lead to ultimately to arthrosis. I have no experience with 3D printing of lower end fibula. Maybe Dr. Kang can enlighten us on that. But what we planned is a reconstruction, which is a biological reconstruction with a peroneus brevis tendon. And this actually was a published technique by Monson et al. in 2014, where they reported three cases with this technique. So this is what we thought we should try here. And that is what we did after resection of the lower end of a fibula and with a good margins, we identified the peroneus brevis tendons at myotendinous junction proximally. And all of us know how to identify a peroneus brevis tendon. It, it is more muscular around the ankle. There you can how this is how you differentiate it from peroneus longus. Once we identify it, we have cut it and then we place a suture anchor around a centimeter and half from the ankle joint. And then the peroneus being tendon is being sutured to this suture anchor. During resection, you can see we have tagged the anterior talofibular and the calcaneofibular ligaments. First, we suture to anterior talofibular ligament with foot in 30 degree of plantar flexion. Then we use a Richard staple in the lower end of a tibia and then reflect the tendon back over the Richard staple and then suture it to the calcaneofibular ligament with uh, in foot in a neutral plantar flexion. And, and then remaining tendon is trimmed or tenodes to the surrounding soft tissues. Once we do that, the rehab usually is, the, that is what we follow and the same was in the paper that we keep patient non-weight bearing for six weeks, two weeks in a slab and four weeks in the cast. And after six weeks, the patient gets a removable ankle foot arthrosis for three months. And during this duration, patient starts 
our gradual weight bearing and then we continued another uh, ankle support which is a lateral ankle support for a period of 3 months the histopathology actually surprised that they called it as a telangiectatic osteosarcoma which was not seen in the pre uh, chemotherapy uh, biopsy the margins were free the necrosis was very poor then patient received four more cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy based on three drug protocols the follow up we immediately post op we can see that the ankle was aligned normally this is at 18 month follow up the alignment was still maintained and this is the patient weight bearing at end of uh, 20 months follow up and we can see that there is no varus valgus instability and there is no flexion extension instability even after a uh, two two and half years of follow up this is our patient walking you can see she can walk normally without any evidence of ankle instability and uh, without any brace at end of two and half years follow up so we so the result was there was no ankle instability and arthrosis the msts was good and we also concluded the same as by the same similar to monson paper monson et al paper is that the lateral ankle reconstruction with a peroneus brevis tendon doing biologically usually gives a very good functional outcome and this is what we published also in the journal of bone and soft tissue tumors this was a case report only but then it was accepted because it was a very atypical reconstruction and a very rare site of a tumor another case that i would like to discuss is the similar situation like we cannot use a mega prosthesis in a small patient in a in a young patient and this is not the best option also so that is what we faced in this 10 year old male child with a pain and swelling in the proximal leg for 4 months the bi- the radiographs were suggestive of osteosarcoma in the metaphyseal area of the proximal tibia this is the mri you can see that the disease is going right up to the physeal cartilage but it is not crossing the physis we did a biopsy it was suggestive of osteosarcoma staging was non metastatic and we had a case with a proximal tibial non metastatic osteosarcoma in a 10 year old male child we gave two cycles of methotrexate based chemotherapy in the standard protocol uh, and this is the post chemotherapy imaging we can see that the disease is almost the same there was no not much soft tissue component here and the disease was going right up to the physeal cartilage on medial side while while the laterally there was some sparing of the physeal cartilage so the concerns that we faced here is as dr kang is mentioning like these are the growing uh, children and we need to think of a growth so that is why we don't want to put a conventional mega prosthesis whether to do an intra articular versus inter calcary resection we know that the physis is a barrier to the tumor spread but the disease is abutting the physis on the medial aspect and what reconstruction or the what kind of a resection then uh, we we should choose and what is the durability i uh, similar to like what dr kang was showing like we can think of a 3d implant but i have no experience so we tend we thought we'll use the biological reconstruction so we planned for an intercalary resection but yes there were some issues here is like the physis is a barrier but the disease was reaching up to the physis medially there is a very small proximal fragment which will be left if we remove the physis and take the cut above the physis and how how to reconstruct an extensor mechanism here so this is what we plan we do not have a intraoperative navigation so we planned this resection on the c arm and uh, we resected the distal fragment first and proximally then we put k wires in coronal plane two k wires just above the physis starting medially we first cross one k wire completely above the physis and then we put another k wire in a different coronal plane just posterior to the first wire almost a centimeter posterior to the first wire and then we started taking our bony cut above these k wires so as to leave a good margin of disease and not to inadvertently enter the physis and which can contaminate our resection so this is what i did till up to the lateral medial two third of the resection i continued uh, the resection above the k wires till the medial two third and then because i wanted to save some bone in the lateral aspect and we knew that the laterally there was the disease was not going up to the physeal cartilage i removed the wires and then i i and tried entering uh, taking the cut through the physis in the lateral third or tried entering in the physeal cartilage and that is how 
we could save some extra bone interlateral but as you can see medially there is only a thin flake of bone left but at least that could give us a clear margin in this surgery so this is a after a complete resection and that is what this is the resection specimen and this was sent for extra corporal radiation we got the tumor specimen back and reconstructed with two medial uh, two plates medially and laterally and for patellar tendon we used a medial gastrocnemius flap and sutured it biologically to the medial gastro flap and we covered the extra corporeal bone as you can see in this picture with the muscles from the surrounding areas so this was the final reconstruction x rays in the ap view and this is at 3 month follow up we can see that the child is having almost normal knee range of movements at 3 month follow up he is doing partial weight bearing and he can do an active slr at 3 months without any lag so and this is these are the x rays which shows a good alignment in the both ap and the lateral view yeah so this is the child uh, after 1 uh, and 1/2 years of follow up where we can see almost a normal normal knee range of movement no lag and the child was doing a full weight bearing walking so this patient has completely healed now having a no almost normal function so we presented the data of these 10 patients intercalary section with small distal oblique proximal fragments in cetos 19 in japan where we presented our results and actually we got a very good outcome we only one of our reconstruction has failed in small proximal segment where there was an implant failure and then we need to revise it with a bigger plate so but yes usually these are challenging situations and if we are able to get a good fixation hold in this small fragments then more or less we are getting a good outcomes now we have started actually customizing a special plates we are not using 3d but we have actually designed a special distal femur plate so that we can get a good screws in a small child and good hold in a smaller fragment so going to the third case this is my last case which i want to show this was a 23 year female with a pain and swelling in the left knee for one and half years and uh, clinically also there was a swelling in the proximal tibial region no lymphadenopathy the radiograph this was a looking like a benign lytic lesion in the proximal tibia most likely a giant cell tumor similar was the mri but as you can see in the axial image there was a huge anterior soft tissue component of the disease and which was actually going in the full area of tibial tuberosity the biopsy was a giant cell tumor and we know it's a campanaki 3 giant cell tumor so the option was either to resect this and put a prosthesis because the extensor mechanism was involved there is a almost a <laughs> full condyle is involved to give initially denosumab and plan for a curettage but we know with giving a denosumab the recurrence rates are high because we are usually not able to do a complete curettage or or we thought we'll straight away go with a curettage something like an excision curettage where we resect the complete anterior cortex and the tibial tuberosity and then try fixation with the cement and do something for an extensor mechanism reconstruction so that is what we did because we thought there's a posterior cortex which is intact we did a thorough intralesional curettage we filled the cavity with bone cement and a plate and reconstruct the soft tissue with a medial gastroc flap with reattachment of patellar tendon so this is a bone window that we created and we did a thorough curetta use high speed burr use pulse lavage and we used a hydrogen peroxide as adjuvant we can see there is no anterior bone which was left and the cavity was stabilized with a plate and then it was filled with the cement the arrow is pointing to the patellar tendon which was then sutured to a medial gastrocnemius flap which we did and the uh, tendon was sutured to this gastroc flap and you can see the post operative x ray the cavity nicely filled with cement although there is no tibial tuberosity now and this at this is the these are the radiographs at 1 month of a follow up 3 months follow up and now 30 months follow up and this is the patient function almost normal knee range of movement no lag and no recurrence so that is what we want to highlight if the in giant cell tumor the most important thing is a complete curettage sometimes we need to do an excision curettage where we need to excise the soft tissue widely and then do a curating of the bone and and then all then we should plan a reconstruction but in a young age we tend not to use a mega prosthesis and tend tend to save the joint as much as possible and this is what the literature also suggests that cement 
ke is a very good uh, very good filling agent in a giant cell tumor and the recurrence rate with cement is low and the other papers also suggest the similar thing and then the risk of cartilage damage also as suggested by this paper which is a small study but then they measured the they see they saw the x rays mri and measured the cartilage oligometric to matrix proteins in follow up and they found that there is no evidence that suggests a long term presence of cement close to the joint will lead to a degenerative arthritis it is mainly because of the mechanical reasons rather than the cement induced damage to the cartilage so this is what i would like to show today and thank you very much for patient listening thanks a lot thank you dr manish yeah. for this informative presentation without any further delay i would now like to invite our third speaker dr abhijit salunke sir i think uh, you can share your presentation now i'm giving you the presenters dr abhijit yes yes ha uh, can you I'm share sorry. are you just one minute Dr Abhijit heads the department of orthopedic oncology at Gujarat Cancer Research Institute he has been performing complex tumor surgeries with total hip and total knee replacement surgeries with tumor mega prosthesis implants he had privilege of being trained at esteemed international and national cancer hospitals he has his keen interest in medical research and published articles in british european and asian journals He is an editorial board member and reviewer in various PubMed index journals. Dr. Abhijit, you can start the presentation. Yes, I am sharing. Yes, just one. Minute. Yes. Dr. Abhijit is chosen to spoke in terms of osteoarticular reconstruction today. Uh, so good afternoon uh, happy independence day to all our participants and esteemed uh, i would like to discuss a few cases of osteoarticular reconstruction in orthopedic oncology these all cases have been performed at uh, gcri gujarat cancer research institute ahmedabad india so in any bone tumor the treatment is of uh, divided into two types one is limb salvage surgery and second is amputation so we will be discussing limb salvage surgeries in today's presentation so in any uh, discussion in india uh, two things are important one is bollywood and second is cricket so if any tumor is resected we have multiple reconstruction options as discussed so as virat kohli is having multiple bowling options who he should use a fast bowler or a spinner so the reconstruction options uh, we will be discussing here Uh, will be involving the joint so the tumor is involving the joint here humerus upper part of humerus is involved metaphysis diaphysis and epiphysis is involved so we will be resecting this much tumor with a good margin and this part will be resected completely so we have to reconstruct this much part and this is the remaining part which will be remaining in the body so we have multiple reconstruction options first will be a non biologic method that will be a mega prosthesis that is commonly used all over the world second option is we are using a innovative technique of a cement spacer uh, which is used uh, at few centers across the world so you can put a simple nail that is a key nail make a cement mantle that will be a nail cement spacer second option can be use a plate if the distal fragment is very small we can use single plate or double plate so again this is a non biologic option third is we can use a biologic option that can be patient's own bone uh, which is other than the tumor bone that can be fibula so we have used in a case of humerus in a child 
we had used a vascularized fibula but it is having its own complication as professor kang told uh, it can fracture so in this case it was fractured so we had to put a plate next option is uh, what we will be discussing in today's uh, discussion that will be a biologic method using the same bone the same tumor bone we will sterilize it out of the tumor with two techniques that we have used one is ecrt that is extracorporeal radiotherapy and second is liquid nitrogen that is cryotherapy so a case of proximal humerus tumor this is the cut where it was resected this is the bone iitv images and we have put it back again with fixed with the help of a plate so we will be discussing and focusing on this biologic methods uh, for osteoarticular reconstruction so we are done ecrt that is extracorporeal radiotherapy or cryo surgery we are very having very limited experience of autoclaving or pasteurization and we have used few cases where we have combined both biologic and non biologic method so we will give go to a case what professor kang told that uh, he had used a 3d implant for similar type of tumor involving a calcaneum so we had a similar case 17 years male with mesenchymal chondrosarcoma which was treated with chemotherapy which is a quite chemo sensitive tumor it, you can appreciate it's quite interosseous disease so we thought that we can attempt limb salvage in this case and we made a 3d model of his leg and plan all the cuts for this case and this is the x ray of him before surgery so this was the skin incision which was taken medial skin incision and this is the short video uh, showing the steps of key steps of the surgery we had covered few key steps uh, this is the neurovascular bundle which was isolated completely and this is the tendon achilles uh, which is shown So next, we planned the cuts for this patient. So we knew that calcaneal tuberosity was free. So we thought that a K wire marker is placed here posteriorly. We'll have a anterior cut. So this is the anterior cut, and a superior cut was planned. Just taking a chip of talus bone. So three cuts were planned. One was posterior cut, one was anterior cut, one one was superior cut. So this was a resected specimen. so we can appreciate a good normal bone is there so we send the frozen of this part this is the posterior part from ten, uh, uh near the calcaneal tuberosity and this was the talus bone and this was the neurovascular bundle so we can appreciate uh, this is the calcaneal tuberosity this is the neurovascular bundle and in upper part is the talus bone so this was the talus upper part cut so we plan to send this specimen for ecrt that is extracorporeal radiotherapy uh, the dose is around 50 grays and duration is around 30 minutes so we had pre preoperatively planned all the cuts so we made a 3d model uh, of this and this was the tumor so this was the anterior cut this was posterior cut and this was the superior cut so we compared this with uh, what we planned before surgery so this is again a 3d model superior view so the tumor was packed uh, in vancomycin soaked mop it was sent to radiotherapy department uh, which was 50 grays 30 minutes duration so this was bone brought back again and this is the upper part this is the calcaneal tuberosity part so this was a talus part we made a trough inside the calcaneum so that we can put a vascularized fibula so we plan to put a vascularized fibula in this bone so we have to make a burr into the calcaneum we made burr into the calcaneum and this was the iitv images for stability we placed two herbert screws and in this cavity we placed the vascularized fibula so this was the iitv images showing two herbert screws and for fixation of the calcaneal tuberosity and tendon achilles we used suture anchors so this was the vascular fibula which was given to us by our vascular surgeon team so the plastic surgeon at our department helped us to get a good vascular fibula with a skin pedal because it's a quite big defect and we have to cover with skin pedal so that we can visualize how good the anastomosis is and to get a good skin coverage so the uh, we take this fibula into the trough made into the calcaneum 
तो स्किन फ्लैप इमीजिएट पोस्ट ऑपरेटिवली एंड दिस वॉज द पोस्ट ऑपरेटिव रेडियोग्राफ यू कैन अप्रिशिएट कैलकैन बैक अगेन this was bit translated upwards but we were unable to bring it down so we had to put in same position suture anchors and we put three herbert screws and this was the fibula place for this patient so we will discuss second case again osteoarticular reconstruction we have a tumor of proximal radius in a 14 years boy which was treated with chemotherapy and very good response to chemotherapy so the treatment options here can be we can use either a definitive radiotherapy second can be we we resect the radius and not put anything we can use a 3d printed model of radius insert it inside here or we can use a fibula so we have total four options so in this case we again used ecrt technique for reconstruction of this we reconstructed the ligament annular ligament here we attached it with the ulna and we sutured the biceps tendon with the radial tuberosity so multiple things were done for this patient so this was a resected specimen with good margins the common peroneal now we have to cut it because it was going inside the tumor and this is the steps of how the soft tissue is removed so we have to be make the bone bare naked so that we have to send it for radiotherapy so this is how soft tissue is removed from the bone uh we use vancomycin soaked mop to decrease chances of infection use a pulse lavage and send it to radiotherapy with a clean sterile environment so this is the radiotherapy machine and we put it back again fix it with the help of plate but we had our set of complication there was necrosis in this part we had again have to take help of our plastic surgeon so he did a free latissimus dorsi flap so this is the vessel where he anastomosed it and it united very well so we can appreciate it's united very well it's a two years follow up and this is the flap which was healed very well so we'd like to share his functional outcome he is a school going boy doing with a full range of movement of elbow good pronation and supination movement so this is the latest video he shared yesterday only we can appreciate there is a wrist drop and fingers he is unable to extend it completely but still he is managing very well to write nicely doing all his school activities and he has given his 10th exam this year you can appreciate his finger extension is not there so we'll plan uh, some surgery for his wrist and this is his right hand right hand dominant you can appreciate his scar here so same limb and he is writing very nicely very good handwriting so osteoarticular reconstruction can give you good outcomes so again a second case uh, proximal radius having sarcoma so we'd like to appreciate here how is the bone looks after radiotherapy so this bone looks very nice and it rarely collapses and we'd we'll like to share uh, what we use for reconstruction this is the semi tendinous and gracilis tendon soft tissue reconstruction we use this we cover the bone annular ligament fix it with the ulna this is the biceps tendon uh, we will anchor it to the radial tuberosity we had made a loop here and we had attached the biceps tendon here so that he will have very good elbow flexion and this is the plate which was used and this is the osteotomy so this was his post op x-ray third case we will uh, move to a next site that is uh, scapula again a uh, uncommon site and this was a uh, quite common tumor chondrosarcoma in a 35 years female so again we can have multiple reconstruction options here we don't put anything just leave the humerus here put a proline mesh that is very commonly done by us so that will be a static suspension with the help of a proline mesh but we here we thought that we can reconstruct this scapula uh, like professor kang said we can use a 3d printed implant but we thought that some other way we can reconstruct it we sent this specimen for ecrt extra corporeal radiotherapy and put it back again so we will share a few key steps of this this was the biopsy scar which was isolated very well here 
is also specific with margin of the glenoid cavity posterior view anterior view and this is a resected specimen so again we will remove whole of the soft tissue from this specimen this is the acromial part this was the glenoid cavity for the patient these are the important steps how we remove the soft tissue so make the bone bare naked remove all the debris remove soft tissue completely remove the soft bone part here do good wash with the help of a pulse lavage use vancomycin antibiotics uh, we use this commonly to decrease chances of infection and pack this bone into sterile environment so that we have to send it to radiotherapy this is a hydrogen soaked mop what we are used here pack it multi years you can bring it back again in the sterile environment you have to put it back again at same side so this is the final step and you send it to radiotherapy so this was a specimen brought after radiotherapy so we used mesh here we prepare a proline mesh sleeve so that this is attached to humerus and the scapula so these are the key steps how this proline mesh sleeve is prepared so it is open at both sides so these are the steps how proline mesh sleeve is prepared and we make multiple holes into the humerus attach the sleeve here and open the stitches here after preparing it so you so ethy bond suture here and fix this mesh and scapula is put inside here so these are the key steps how it was placed here so this is ecrt treated scapula autograft bone we'll put it inside the mesh suture it we had made multiple holes into the scapula bone so that we can anchor the muscles so this is how soft tissue is attached and we made multiple holes into the scapula here so we can appreciate here multiple holes are made into the scapula so that the adjacent soft tissue can be attached to prevent winging of the scapula because very minimal soft tissue is there so this was her immediate post op x ray and this is her follow up x ray uh, uh, we'll discuss uh, last two cases this is again same case what we discussed in the first slide this is how liquid nitrogen is placed this is the last case which we we'll like to share a uh, case of 12 years boy with osteosarcoma of proximal tibia so here we have option that we can use a uh, expandable mega process so we thought that we will do osteoarticular reconstruction for him this was a resected specimen this is the neurovascular bundle so this was the bone which was sent to radiotherapy we can see the menisca is quite good so this ecrt treated bone was put back again at the host site we used here multiple options to reconstruct anterior cruciate ligament medial collateral and lateral collateral here tfl tensor fascia lata was harvested we used suture anchor to create medial collateral and lateral collateral ligaments so this is the collateral ligaments which were created and fixed with the tibia we used anterior cruciate ligament reconstruction so we harvested the semi tendinosus and gracilis which was used here place so this was the tendon which was recreated this was the screws and a disc was used for reconstruction of acl and we can appreciate that the patellar tendon is reattached to the tibial tuberosity part this was his immediate post operative radiograph and this was a follow up radiograph and this was his functional outcome at follow up so thank you uh, to all our esteemed speakers and uh, all our uh, guests who have attended this lecture uh, many thanks to my colleague dr mayur kamani it's always a team effort that uh, tumor surgeries are done so thank you very much thank you dr abhijit you still have dr abhijit five more minutes left so i can discuss and i know, you, of, and I know you have been doing a lot of expandable processes so we will so like to discuss that expandable was the benefit of the attendees yeah, so we share one case yes yeah, so we have time for 5 minutes so i'll just sum yes. in 5 minutes only
So this is a case of So again, a case, a young girl, eight years girl, uh, who had some lesion in the proximal femur, which uh, she showed to orthopedic surgeon. He diagnosed it as an aneurysmal bone cyst. He thought that it's a benign lesion and he will do surgery for her. She placed two nails inside. And after a few months, it was a big lesion. So he thought that it's something wrong. This may be a malignant tumor. And here the patient was referred to us for further management. So you evaluated her, we did bone marrow biopsy for her and staging workup, it was Ewing sarcoma. The patient was treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy and still it was a non-metastatic lesion. So we thought that we can attempt limb salvage for her. So again, same analog, uh, we saw a cricket analog there. Here it's a movie analog. Uh, this is Kajol and this is Shah Rukh Khan. So Kajol has most probably missed the train. So we have to bang our heads, what to do next? So we should read a X-ray very properly. So we prepared a good minomic, which is A, B, C, D, E, F. A is age of the patient. So it's a skeletally immature child. Which bone is involved? Is proximal femur bone involved? Which bone is involved? Proximal femur. Which part of the bone? It's metaphysis, diaphysis. We can clearly appreciate it's an ill-defined lesion. We are unable to differentiate where the tumor is starting, where it's ending. So it doesn't look benign to us. So it will be a very good habit that we read an X-ray with this minomic A, B, C, D. And externally, there is a periosteal reaction. So radiologically, it doesn't fit into a benign tumor criteria. So we have to evaluate the patient with X-ray, followed by MRI, followed by biopsy. Don't directly jump into surgery. So this was the radiograph post chemotherapy, a very good response. We thought that we can perform an expandable mega prosthesis for her. She was an eight years girl. So it was a planned a total femur expandable megaprosthesis, which was of invasive type. So this is what we are using, invasive type. Non-invasive are too costly for our patients. So we are not using this technique. We are using this minimally invasive expandable megaprosthesis. So uh, just a design, how this is planned. Again, 3D model is done. We use CADICAM technique and plan how much resection will be there, how much expansion will be required for this patient. An example, how this is an example of distal femur expandable megaprosthesis. The small incision you have to give and a screwdriver is placed and this part grows. So this is based on worm drive mechanism so that the expanding part is encased inside that part and telescopically it grows. So these are the parts of expandable distal femur megaprosthesis. This is the stem, this is the main part, this is the stem part, and this is the TBL part. Again, whole thing is customized according to the patient size, and this is the expanding area. So we can expand maximally up to five to six centimeters. Every six months, 0.5 to one centimeter is expanded. So again, going to the same case, uh, this was the skin incision. This was a biopsy scar. This was a tumor which is resected with good margins. This was the resected femur. We can appreciate the protruding nails here. So small chances of contamination. But we thought that it, this must have been taken care by chemotherapy. So this was the expandable prosthesis which was placed. This was the muscle flap which was put inside. And this is the expanding area. Every time you have to give small incision here. So this is the growing part and we are doing expansion here. We can appreciate how this process expands. So all our colleagues, Dr. Jaimin, me and Raul, were pointing out where the expansion is. And uh, we are rotating the screw. And this part is growing. This is the expanding part. And this part prevents the back fall of this implant. So we are, we are skeptical. This was our first expandable case that uh, the expansion may fail and this part may go back again. So it was taken care by this part. So this was her immediate post-operative radiograph. This is the small part which we need to expand in future. So we had small complication. There was a hinge pin back out here. So small surgery was done again. This was placed back and circle was placed here. And this is always a small incision you require for expansion. It is a lateral expansion scar. So this is our expansion technique. We put 
two needles mark the expansion and this is a screw and this is how it is expanding so this is the part which is expanded and we can appreciate the scar here so the opposite length limb is 29 cm this is 28.78 cm in future we are expecting small complication here the femoral head may come out of this socket very less likely so we had prepared long side femoral head for this patient the tbi is smaller in size so this may require some surgery in future so it expanded now nearly 3 to 4 cm down and this is now nearly 4 years follow up for her so we can appreciate her functional outcome this is the knee flexion these are two scars we can appreciate medial scar and a lateral scar she is walking without any support or any aid she can climb stairs up and down and doing all her activities she had a pulmonary metastasis uh, which was taken care by our uh, surgical oncologist uh, he did a wax and uh, it's now nearly 2 years follow up after that surgery also so the take home message for this case will be we should uh, evaluate the x rays very properly use this simple mnemonic a b c d e f and use of expandable mega prosthesis can be helpful for pediatric patients so we are still learning Dr. yeah oh, thanks for paying much of this sir moving ahead to the next session yeah uh of discussion with our expert panel uh, yes. i would like to invite dr vivek verma he is a consultant and head of orthopedic oncology at uh, specialty unit i would also like to invite team he is orthopedic oncology surgeon at korea cancer hospital he is currently interested in molecular characterization of sarcomas and dr jamin shah from uh, osteocare cancer center he believes in aggressive uh, treatment and is a compassionate indi innovative individual i would request our panelists to share their comments and with respect to the presentation made by our speakers and uh, and it was really a very enlightening session and, uh, how many different cases have seen we showed that now how we are pushing the boundary of insolvency yes at the time probably two to three decades ago where amputation was the only option and then came the era of uh, using prosthesis and now how we have evolved <laughs> not just from the process but using all the recent advances uh, especially about the customized 3d implants for preserving the leg the cases which were supposed to be amputated here especially more in terms of uh, i would say uh, the discussions which have come out is the use of biological reconstruction which first time uh, obviously of uh, future surgery in case once it heals properly so i want to thank all our speakers who have shown very interesting cases and uh, uh, i have few questions from all my speakers so shall i start by manchu how do you think should i start sir, i think we should, should we should go by presenter by we can first take the questions and your comments for dr kang then okay. once we finish with dr kang we will go ahead with the uh, second presenter manish right Okay. Okay. So, uh, Professor Khan, uh, thank you for sharing your experience with us, and it was wonderful. Uh, I have few basic questions because uh, in India, the choice of the uh, three D printed technology is the biggest constraint is the cost because their yes, patients have to pay out of their pocket. Very rarely they are insured, and so. we opt for biological type of reconstruction but i want to ask you for bio for bio function you must for can you hear me um <laughs> thank you very much um the howling the sound uh, is not clear 
Um, I can also you hear me? Do you hear me? Hear me? Himanshu, I think there is some disturbance we can hear. Sir, I think I, I'll just mute you for one second and ask you ask your question to him regarding the diaphyseal uh, reception parts there, whether to use the biological method in that or I can tell you which one you prefer for diaphyseal reception, biological or mechanical? Okay, okay. Um, I think uh, the in the, in, the, in the young children or older too, I think the important thing is uh, the mechanical stability, at least uh, during the chemotherapy or uh, radiation therapy after surgery. So biology reconstruction, as I um, uh, think, the two week, two week. Well, I'm wondering, um, in India, uh, as your cases, do you usually doing uh, extracorporeal radiation therapy? Yes. So that is something which we commonly do. And in fact, in last few years, uh, we have moved more to in situ sterilization with the use of liquid nitrogen. So rather than making two cuts and taking the bone completely out of the body, wherever it's possible, I would like to do a in situ pedicle sterilization with the liquid nitrogen. That, oh. that preserves the vascularity from one end and so the complications of a complete avascular bone, like uh, pathological collapse, fracture, infection, is much more reduced. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think the extracorporeal radiation, we, I have no experience about that, but my senior doctors um, uh, used uh, that method. And they said to us, the problem is the two week, two week. So they are uh, put into uh, extracorporeal radiation and put into bone cement to but it's also two week. So I, uh, I worry about the two week extracorporeal radiation therapy. Uh, even in this capsular case, chondrocytoma, I think the chondrocytoma does not detect uh, uh, by radiation therapy. So we need a consideration of uh, the radiation effectiveness about that. But the uh, um, cryosurgery or liquid nitrogen is okay. We used to also that. The problem is the fixation and the longevity. Okay. Thank you. So I totally agree with you that when we do extracorporeal radiotherapy, the bone becomes weak. Uh, and especially the cases have to be selected very properly. Mm -hmm. If the bone quality is weak and if there is a pathological fracture or cortical breach, usually either we do not use extracorporeal radiotherapy or if we use, we can add a vascularized fibula so that it gives additional strength. I think Dr. Jamin wants to add something. Um, so can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, Dr. Jamin, we can hear you. So what uh, we have seen is that the chances of healing they are much more quicker when we use a liquid nitrogen rather than an ECRT because of the preservation of bone matrix protein with liquid nitrogen rather than ECRT. So now I have shifted from ECRT to using a liquid nitrogen because of the two advantages that it gives a quicker healing rate and the quality or the strength of the bone is also very much well maintained as compared to a ECRT bone. So in that way, the liquid nitrogen is better than an ECRT bone. Yes, yes, very right. And another thing is the advantage of ECRT over liquid nitrogen is when we when we have to sterilize the bone in ECRT, it does not distort the architecture. I mean, whatever you are giving into the machine, the same comes out. But with liquid nitrogen, sometimes you may have fracture because of the uh, bubble, because of the pressure of the gas, there might be fracture and uh, it would uh, lead to your reconstruction more difficult. 
Dr. Vivek, I wanted to ask to Dr. Manish something. Uh, he has been there at Tata from pretty long time, and he has a large experience about extracorporeal radiotherapy. Dr. Manish, I wanted to ask you, what is the rationale behind soaking vancomycin mops in a bowl, which would go for extracorporeal radiotherapy? Does it actually prevent some infection, or it's topical based therapy diluted with large amount of saline? So, Doctor Himanshu, actually, it is absolute. It is like a like a practice that uh, that we are following. But it is absolutely. It is not like it has to be absolutely done. You can even wrap it in a. But only thing is, you need to wrap it in a wet mop to reduce mm -hmm. the air. So, so to reduce so that the radiation is effective, you need you cannot have a air air pockets in between. So mm -hmm. rather than putting only in the saline, you can add some betadine soaked saline or a vancomycin soaked saline or even a plain saline that is absolutely fine. So it's a practice which is being followed because as an orthopedic surgeon, the thing that we fear most is an infection and putting a one gram or two gram of a vancomycin does not actually cause much damage to the patient or change the cost. <laughs> but absolutely, if you have a good OT condition, I don't think it is necessary to wrap it in a vancomycin soaked mouth. But yes. Uh, it's a practice that was being followed at Tata Memorial and that is the same thing that we are following. But practically, the infection rates uh, does not change much even if you uh, if you have a good OT environment and you wrap it in a normal saline mop. Only thing that I want to make a comment here as Dr. Kang was asking like a weak bone in ECRT. So all, all femur ECRTs that we are doing, we are adding a vascularized fibula. All, uh, unless the child is very small, tolerate a very very big surgery like a 60 year old child having an intercalary resection of femur uh, so that in that case i'll putting another uh, doing another big surgery is difficult otherwise all femur ecrt we add fibula and all tbl ecrts we are not adding and the tbl ecrts are healing very well even without any adding fibula so and unless the tumor is absolute uh, uh, lytic as vivek has mentioned then we tend to use other reconstruction options otherwise the extracorporeal radiation works very well and so i also want to ask our panelists today uh, regarding the question with dr kang put up uh, does histopathological diagnosis uh, change the plan what kind of treatment we want to use for autographs like he said for chondrosarcoma he is skeptical in using extracorporeal radiotherapy you anything does not matter so are you asking me yeah and you can also tell the you have more learned than us and your experience matters a lot so uh, so i think vivek can answer vivek Okay, so uh, the question, because I think the logic behind that is uh, few tumors are considered radio sensitive, few considered radio resistant. Like we say, osteosarcoma or chondrosarcoma, these are radio resistant type of tumors. So we can also ask it how safe it is to use uh, ECRT, extracorporeal radiotherapy, in histological types of tumors. So I would say the dose of radiation, what we give, for uh, radiotherapy is 50 gray in a single fraction. So that is too high a dose. And at this dose, there is nothing remains like radio resistant or radio sensitivity. And it is safe enough to kill all the cells, whichever is used in that field. So it is a uh, very safe procedure. And I think there is a paper from Tata Memorial also, which has around 74 patients, preliminary reports which were published and which has shown a good uh, oncological outcomes in terms of local recurrences. And all the bones which was radiated, there was no direct local recurrence, although it was in the vicinity in the last tumors, I, I think in few cases. So it is a very safe procedure. Dr. Manish or Jamin, you can add up to that. I, I, I agree with you. Like it is, uh, we are giving such a high dose, it killed all viable cells, including all tumor cells. So, I think it is safe. Uh, Dr. Himanshu, if you allow, can I ask a question to Dr. Kang? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Sure, sir. Go ahead. So, Dr. Kang, I just want to know, like, we are, you are using now a lot of 3D printing implants. Okay. Yeah. So, my, my worry is, like, almost all the sites you are putting a 3D implants in the pelvis, in the humerus, in the femur. 
so like that's implant cast implants or the striker implant gmrs or the even the smith and nephew it required lot of research lot of years of a metallurgical research plus an implant research after which they have been able to provide a stable implant which lasts for a lit, uh, significant duration of time like 3d printing implants is made by some company which has not been there in the implant uh, so what is the durability like what is the chance that these implants can fail because we know that the striker implant is there now for 25 years fine huh. we know we know that the ga the implant cast is manufacturing the implants for more than two decades so the durability we know the quality so how how do you maintain because this is the my my worry in using a 3d printing from any any company which is making a 3d implant in india so what is the durability now like how how confident we are in using a 3d printing implant here so that is my my worry i think sir that is a very valid question because if we want to use 3d printing in india we have to be very careful what the implant companies providing us whether they have those certifications or not what is their experience in making experience. implants because we know that the other companies the striker the implant cast they have a very good research background in making the implant that is yeah. my my worry that is what i want to professor kang what, what do you suggest how do you do go about it and <laughs> how much failure you are seeing in 3d printing implant how much failure as compared to the standard implant that you were using yes the the 3d printing implant material is uh, as you know titanium alloy when i revision surgery when i had the revision surgery i surprised the, the formally attached the soft tissue and the bony integration to match the uh, 3D implant. I first time I worried about the supplementary titanium powder as a big mega process uh, implantation of 3D uh, titanium implant. I based the research about that. Broad, uh, and have about drainage titanium for a while. And later, um, when they came to our patient colony, I checked the blood uh, titanium level. There is nothing similar, similar normal. So I think the already firmly attached soft tissue of titanium space. It makes a uh, uh, prevent uh, separatory titanium body. So, and uh, the longevity in South Korea, we don't have yet uh, approved about joint articular surface. So, I conjugation with the conventional astroplasty implant processes. So, the problem is the breakage. So, I designed it more more detailedly and uh, more uh, stable and um, uh, sometimes a thicker plate. So I think uh, uh, it's very safe and um, available and um, very, I expect the longevity very long time. So, but uh, I have only five years experience I have to go together. Thank you, Manishi. And I have a, one question to uh, Manu, Dr. Manishi. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Do you uh, do you have uh, intraoperative intraoperative adjuvant to therapy in the GCT? My means the razor or liquid nitrogen gun or spray mode of electric bulbic cauterization. Yeah. Do you usually do? So the only adjuvant that I am using is sir hydrogen peroxide. I am not using liquid nitrogen, uh -huh. no organ laser, or but but the recurrence rate in a primary giant cell tumor is less than five percent if we do it nicely. So that is what I have realized because the most important thing I think what what the major studies also show is the use of high speed bar and a pulsatile lavage. I think these two are the key factors in a giant cell tumor curettage. And the third important factor is we are using hydrogen peroxide because as if, because we are seeing more of a Campanaki three giant cell tumors which are recurring. Yeah. Okay. 
and and if you see a campanaki three giant cell tumor almost half of the tumor in the, in the soft tissue half is in the bone fine yeah. so in the soft tissue you are not using any kind of adjuvant whether it's argon laser or liquid nitrogen so the recurrence risk risk is mainly depends upon your surgical technique how cleanly you reduce the contamination and how thoroughly you use your high speed bar in extending so otherwise uh, i think if you do these two do steps properly reduce the contamination use a high speed bar then your recurrence should be low so i am not using and we are very happy not using it <laughs> there are there are many people who are using and they claim that it is helping so i think we can continue with that yeah i i usually use the the uh Rager, argon rager, and the liquid nitrogen gun, and yeah. sometimes um, for electric agent, yeah. and it makes uh, a much redu reduce, I think, much reduce the uh, recurrent. In the joint space, in the adjacent, just the uh, adjacent to joint area, yeah, subcontral, yeah, yeah, subcontral area. I graft the I graft bone chip on um, two centimeter, maybe absolutely, and then. And then, bone cement. It may be cement. That makes a joint uh, uh, yes. preservation. So yeah, Professor that is what. Kang, yeah, yeah. I would want to ask Professor Kang something. Professor Kang, how much is the lead time for you to plan an implant and get the implant before implantation? How much time do you take, uh, or your implant companies take when you plan to do a printed ah. implant? Yes, uh, as I showed uh, my last slide, the pathology fracture thirteen years old TBR case. I did it within one week, seven days. Seven days. Yeah. So it's very fast. This is, the problem is the company, not me. <laughs> I, I can design the, with my step on. With my cell phone, everywhere, every times, and my bed and my living room. The problem is uh, uh, the companies. So, so you design with the CT based or a MRI based? Um, two. The originally CT based, and I send it to uh, MRI together. And sir, if in these seven days or in fifteen days the patient develops a pathological fracture. So you're yeah, yeah, yeah. You need the uh, uh, You I need to be. Uh huh. Yes. <laughs> sir, can I ask some question? Ah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Doctor Jamin wanted to. Ah, uh, Doctor Professor Kang, very good presentation. Uh, uh, I you. just, I just wanted to ask, how confident are you using a customized zig in taking a cut? How, how confident that it will be perfectly sitting to your bone? Means I have a very much ah. doubt that whatever zig I will be using, whether that cut will be perfect or maybe one or two centimeter up and down, and you are in a mess. So how confident are you using Bro. a uh, customized zig or a, versus a navigation? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jamin, actually, same question. I also wanted to ask a little bit of this, but I just add up so that I don't have to ask again. So, especially about the using of zig versus computer navigation in planning the cuts. Yes. Yes. Okay, sir, exactly. Doctor Singh, you can. Doctor Kim, you can. Actually, in South Korea, um, National Cancer Center start to uh, uh, navigation surgery in the bone tumor. Um, Doctor Joe and I um, started uh, the navigation surgery, but we did not these days. We do not these days because it's too. Difficult to registration. Or uh, yeah, registration is very difficult in the navigation surgery. So, but the three D printing, the problem is the long bone jig because the the smooth bone which area uh, there is no um, uh, convex concave uh, concave area, but pelvis and scapula. It's very easy to attach the jig because the convex and concave area there are so many. The problem is a long bone. Yeah, so like, sometimes we uh, have to uh, joint from joint, or uh, sometimes you use together 
CM fluoroscopy, and sometimes uh, uh, more detailed uh, uh, design the, the uh, pre-operative plan, the centimeter from each area, each area centimeter. The combination needed in the long run, I think. So I think I would want to add a little bit regarding the use of uh, navigation. I think uh, we use a OM based navigation system, which the spinal surgery team has been using it. The registration is a little easy. But the part where we combine navigation surgery along with the 3D printed implants, the navigation only work till the time we have made the osteotomy cut. After we've made the osteotomy cut and there is a discontinuity within the bone, the navigation stops working because the reference points are not there. So uh, navigation can help uh, during the jig placement, but after you make one cut, it would not work. It would just fail because your registration markers have changed. That is what I feel. I mean, Yes, in the bone tumor, the navigation solder is a very time-consuming procedure. Um, even the registration, the, we have to do uh, we have to do the pre-operative bone marking. Yes. Or uh, we don't have to. We don't. Need, we don't need the surface marking because uh, we have to do wide each mm -hmm. We we have to do we have to do surgery without the thinking of, of uh, tumors. So uh, there is a uh, uh, so complex thing, uh, registration of uh, navigation surgery. So therefore, I don't do that. I think Dr. Yong so Kim wanted to ask something. Dr. Yong so Kim. Mm, uh, thank you for the great talk, uh, Professor Kang. In regards of the cost effectiveness, I guess the price is also the problem for applying the 3D printing of, uh, implant. So I guess in, in our institute, we are not doing 3D printing uh, in a lot of reasons, but how do you how do you compare the price uh, and cost effectiveness between the uh, biological reconstruction and uh, prosthesis and 3D printings? Yeah, thank you, Dr. yong -sung. Uh, the price in South Korea, the price is um, uh, uh, not so not so expensive, not so expensive. Less than less than uh, uh, ten ten thousand, less than ten thousand dollars U.S. dollars. So I think I think but every patient every patient wanted to their uh, specific own and customized implant. Uh, when I uh, when I uh, uh, explain about the reconstruction method, so the price is not the problem to the patient. They wanted to. Uh, 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 Recently, technological uh, something they wanted to technical uh, um, very uh, good things. So I think the price is not a problem. Okay. I also would like to add up that um, in Korea we have alternatives such as uh, allograph instead of, you know, uh, recycled autograph. So I asked the question because we, we have uh, some more options instead of, you know, specific in, in specific occasions, which is, you know, which in which 3D printing is necessary, but we'll still have other options like allograph, such as APC also. Yes, right, right. The, in the starting of the 3D printing part, we needed uh, Need the restriction of the, of the using in cases. Sometimes I used the allograft. Sometimes I use the liquid nitrogen autograft. Sometimes I use the pasteurized autograft. The indication is um, very important. 
especially in the starting of uh, 3D printing. Therefore, uh, there, uh, that, that is a very important thing because uh, some senior doctor and uh, some uh, junior doctors, uh, the conviction of uh, the 3D printing point, I've, I have to do uh, each the one of the thing. It's the, yeah, yes. It's only one of the thing of the rim salvage method. The 3D print is not all, I think. Dr. Manish, I would want to ask you something regarding the second case which you presented, proximal tibia uh, neoplastic lesion. Uh, uh, what is your uh, take on re-epiphysis prosthesis which are available, which are uh, physis bearing prosthesis, uh, which have a distal fixation and a proximal fixation in the epiphysis? Or did you encounter any limbland discrepancy by the method you chose to do? where you, uh, the physis of tibia was gone? Yeah, absolutely, Himanshu. So we first, uh, I'll answer the second part of a question first. Uh, limblet discrepancy we expect when we are sacrificing the proximal tibial physis in a 10-year-old child. So once the patient finished the chemotherapy and he was six months down the line when we were certain about the union of this site and we knew that, that this site is surviving well, this uh, limb has healed. So we did a epiphysial disease of the opposite side and that is what we counseled the family. And regarding the expendable processes, uh, that an intercalary expendable processes, in this child, I think the proximal fragment was very small. We only had a 2 to 3 millimeter of a bone on the medial side, right, up, up to the medial half. So I think putting a proximal tibial uh, intercalary prosthesis with a 3 millimeter or 4 millimeter of a bone with no fixations medially, I think we can expect a lot of difficulty or a chance of very high risk of failure. So that is why we didn't choose, plus there are cost issue, because in India, most of the implant that we are getting is invasive expendable, which personally carries a very high risk of infection over the years. So, and but sir, yes. One more thing, uh, regarding one case which Dr. Abhijit presented, I would want your opinion in that, where it was a proximal uh, femur having coma treated with nails. Uh, yeah. What is your opinion? You would have chosen to do a rotation plasty because you are a, a very good uh, promoter of rotation plasty and uh, I don't think so you would have chosen to do an expandable prosthesis for that patient. Only matter of fact, the limb length discrepancy which would the patient land up with uh, removing the physis of the tibia also. So what is so, your on that? So I, I feel that the child is too small to get an invasive expendable prosthesis because what we are expecting is a limb length discrepancy of more than 10 centimeters uh, over the years. And for an invasive prosthesis, you can maximum lengthen by almost 7 to 8 millimeter in a go. And you expect 10 to 12 lengthenings, which risk the infection a very lot, a very high. And second thing, there is a risk of implant failure. The implant is small. So at that age, I will tend to counsel the, my patient for rotation plasty, which gives a much more stable reconstruction. And only thing that you need to change is a prosthesis rather than putting an invasive expendable prosthesis. Yeah, if you have a good non-invasive expendable, maybe I can choose. But in that, the affordability is a big issue in our setup. But in uh, I will not choose... Uh, Invasive expendable when we expect a limb length discrepancy of more than 5-6 cm or more than 5-6 lengthening that the patient requires because the risk of infection increases with every invasive lengthening that you do. That is Doctor, my so, yes, so uh, the case was of not a uh, uh, clean case. It was of a rotted sarcoma. So we uh, analyze our data. So the outcome of rotted sarcoma is quite poor. So majority of patients die before 3-4 to four years. So, if we expect something long for the child, uh, the survival will be less for this patient. So, she has survived four years. We have done one metastectomy. So, it's now four years follow-up. Maximum patients of our series, around we have 25 patients of rotted sarcoma. And nearly none of them has survived more than five years. So, we have done we will do epiphyseal disease for her on opposite side. She survives well. And in the future, if something happens to this implant, we can convert it to a normal total femur. Uh, that was a 
thinking rational behind this case. But it's a case of broader sarcoma, and we expect poor survival from. Uh, it was very uh, better survival as we expected. It's now four years survival. So we thought that uh, there will be high chances of metastasis in this case, pulmonary metastasis. So that was a rational using. This case for invasive type of spondylar necrosis, rather than doing a rotation plasty, we are expecting poor survival and the child will have a no limb. So with this limb, she is doing quite well, walking well, uh, doing all her activities. We more confidence to her and her family. So that was a rational. Mm, uh, In which case, my expandable mega process. In this case, uh, do you want? So, to... Jamin, so my friend Jamin will also highlight something there about this case. Yes, sir. Okay, absolutely fine. <laughs> Jamin, uh, Doctor Jamin will highlight some points for this case. Okay, whatever is, but it's fine. Whatever you are given the explanation, that is absolutely true. So obviously so, there are a lot of options both, uh, available. Both of us, the thinking was same that uh, the child will survive less as a case of rotted sarcoma. Yes, sir. I think it is important to counsel the patient and the family in detail about all the options that we have and with the. There is complications of each, and then they can choose what suits them. And the problem with rotation plasty is the cosmetic appearance, and because of which many people don't opt for it and rather would like to go for an amputation. And in those circumstances, I think it is very much justified that we use expandable processes and an amputation. So nowadays we have started terminal plasty also. So just chop off the foot part. So the cosmetics doesn't look that bad. So that can be also option here. That put the tibia inside the hip joint and chop off the leg foot part. So the patient will have a limb which is of uh, above knee amputation. So that part can be expanded in future with some help of external fixator. So we have main, done few cases. Main, so main yeah. issue is with always they start surgery is a cosmetic appearance. So, so if so your so patient gets counsel, then you can do it. But it's a visa visa thing. The patient don't agree, then you have to counsel of all the options which are available. And I don't think there is any content again using a invasive expandable prosthesis. So turnoplasty again can be a good option for these cases. Sir, the one more question which I would want to ask to our panelists regarding Dr. Abhijit's case of scapular reconstruction with the complete osteoarticular. Uh, I would want to ask the panel: Do they prefer to do a no reconstruction? Or a scapular reconstruction with hmm. respect to function which the patient would have eventually. Okay, so I would say in my experience, all the total scapulectomies, what I have done, I have not done any reconstruction. But now, as we see, we all grow and learn, and hmm. I am now more going into favor of uh, uh, doing a reconstruction with ECRT. And it depends upon the amount of the bone involved and the uh, soft tissue involvement. The interesting part was the case which uh, Dr. Abhijit had shown had a lot of soft tissue component, and so I was just worried that after removing the entire soft tissue and then putting it back, the I don't know the chances of infection and all because then the scapula is just subcutaneous. So what was his experience in the long term follow up? removing all the soft tissues and then in a subcutaneous location of the disease yes, so we are putting a long term follow up of this case um, in majority of cases nearly every case we are doing no reconstruction we are either putting a mesh or no reconstruction so that is our most common method what we use we are having no experience with the prosthesis so we are not used a scapular prosthesis and this was our first case where we used ecrt and we thought that The patient gets at least twenty thirty degree of movements of shoulder. Uh, our no reconstruction method gives just ten degrees to fifteen degrees movement, and it's just the patient will be able clean his axilla and do a twenty to thirty degree movement. So that was the aim here. So the mesh may achieve that uh, because it will give bit fibrosis and uh, shoulder movement may be there. We thought that here we can use the LD flap, but the particle was going inside. We Had uh, our plastic surgeon with us, we thought that we will transfer LD lattice mesh dorsi for better coverage. But uh, the pedicle was going inside it. So next case we will try where the soft tissue is less. 
we will combine CRT with a pedicle flap. So that we are thought that for next year we can plan it. Uh, I have a question from our speakers as well as panelists. So, what about in total scapulectomies? Use of like three D implant with inverse shoulder. Is it going to help functionally? Um, <laughs> I think it's not a good function. It's not provide a good function. Uh, but in the end, the function is not good uh, every method, I think. But uh, the, I think the limited uh, reconstruction of the scapula is needed uh, because uh, of uh, the body shape, body shape, uh, cosmetically. As, but the functional uh, outcome is not good, I think. Okay. Dr. Kim, do you have any experience with scapular uh, uh, reimplantation or processes? Uh, I have a few cases of total scapulectomy, but I didn't reconstruct the scapula. You didn't reconstruct. And um, in my opinion, glenoid, glenoid might be necessary for the anchoring uh, anchor, an necessary as an anchor for further evaluation, but. I don't think we need whole scapula for reconstruction. Uh, I think those allograft or recycled autograft would increase the risk of the infection and doesn't function as it used to be. So uh, that's, I don't think we need reconstruction for the uh, total scapula. So I have seen one case of uh, extracorporeal radiation of scapula not operated by me. Operated by some other oncosurgeon, but I've seen that patient on follow-up, completely radiated scapula put back, and that patient actually had got a very good function, almost like a 90 degree of abduction that the patient was able to do. So I was very happy and very much interested, like next scapulectomy, maybe I'll plan doing an extracorporeal radiation and try to put it back and use a proline mass to suture. Because I saw uh, getting a 90 degree of abduction is very useful for a patient rather than a no abduction. So I've seen only one patient having a good function with no infection. It is too immature to say it, is, it works well. But yes, as Himanshu has pointed, that the risk of infection because there is no soft tissue will be high. So I don't know. But yes, people have tried using a radiation and I've seen a patient with a very good function on follow-up. Yeah. I have one more question. Uh, sure. Yes. Dr. Kim, Dr. Kim want. Uh, yes, Dr. Kim, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Manish. Thank you yes. for a great presentation. And I have a question regarding the case, uh, number one case. Yeah. If you can use allograft in your country, would you consider yeah. using allograft for reconstruction of the distal uh, fibula rather than, you know, performing the same uh, procedure? Yeah. So, yes, uh, in at, when I was at Tata Memorial, we were using a lot of allograft. Uh, because you need an allograft is harvested with the ligaments and the matched allograft. Yeah, if it is available, then I, I can use that and because that gives much more ankle stability. Yeah, but uh, to get a proper matched allograft with, uh, removed with the ligament and especially in my city, it's not possible because we are not getting a fresh frozen allograft here, the sterilized allograft. In Tata Memorial, we have a tissue bank where you can get an allograft. So I think it is easier there. But at, at in my city, I am not able to get those kind of allografts with the ligaments. Okay, we can get a freeze dried allograft from there. But to get the allograft from the other city is not possible. Otherwise, yeah, allograft uh, using a fibular a match allograft is an option in these kind of scenarios. I agree with you, sir. Okay, thank you very much. In, in yeah. Korea, too, we have uh, a lot of allograft, fresh frozen allograft, but allograft with uh, ligaments, it is hard to find. So yeah. we need to uh, search for uh, those uh, precious allografts. But I guess you did a great job. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. I think Dr. Vivek wanted to ask something. Uh, yes. So I think... Uh, the most challenging scenario is osteoarticular resection and then using either allograft or uh, your same stabilized bone. So I think uh, Dr. Abhijit had shown a very interesting case where uh, osteoarticular resection was done and then he used the same bone and did not resurface with an implant. 
So, what is the opinion of the panelist? Uh, like, uh, we need to see in the long term, but I think uh, should we resurface with the constraint type of processes? This gives sense. But I think in his, in his case, he reconstructed all the ligaments. Yes. Uh, with, so, uh, having a constraint processes without having a constraint processes, a normal surface replacement would have been much better for the knee. So, yeah, I wanted Actually to damage. Know whether others are using that because uh, what I know in India, uh, there is scarcity of the bone bank which provides uh, pro, uh, this uh, allograft and all the soft tissue attachments. What we have, like the frozen allografts, but those are just structural. We have just the bony scaffold, but not all these like soft tissue attachments and the ligamentous attachments. So, any experience of our speakers to this? Dr. Kang, uh, Dr. Manish, any opinions regarding use of osteoarticular uh, treated uh, grafts, autografts? I think the, the um, osteoarticular autograft uh, 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 is a corporeal radiation therapy or pasteurized autograft. I think uh, eventually that this uh, all the destroyed, all the problem. So, therefore, uh, I attempt to the bone cement injection after pure plagiarism and uh, extra corporeal uh, something, uh, cryo, and then put into the bone cement. The longevity is a little bit longer, but the problem is articular pain, something on. So we need more stable, we need more conjugation of uh, uh, autobahn and articular processes in 3D. We need conjugation, I think, and I try to do that. Thank you. So, so can I add? Can I yes, add? Yeah. So what I think and what I have been uh, learned is that from now onward the people have stopped using osteoarticular allografts because of the complications. And there's a very recently published article where they have just told bluntly know that there are very high chance of complications with instability and late collapse whenever you're using an osteoarticular allograft or using an autograft, whether it's an ECRTD autograft or liquid nitrogen. So, these have got very large number of late complications and they have stopped using uh, worldwide osteoarticular autografts or allografts and they have moved to resurface, uh, uh, resurface that uh, graph. That is yeah. what I think. So, same issue Himanshu, like the, our aim was, our aim here is to maintain the distal femoral physis for the growth. That is yes. why we are thinking of not putting a conventional mega prosthesis here. But by reconstructing the ACL ligament and drilling a trinal through a distal femoral physis, I think you are risking the growth disturbance at distal femoral physis. So I will not try to reconstruct at least the ACL ligament here because the chance of an asymmetrical growth happening when you put a tunnel through a distal femoral physis. So my suggestion is it is better to resurface and get a constrained kind of a prosthesis at a resurface if you are planning for a reconstruction and that prevents a cartilage damage also as Jamin is highlighting. So, I, so I will not... Can, so sir, what is your opinion regarding just putting just a... Just, 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 so what we can do is we can do a semi-processes type of uh, reconstruction. Means you just replace the TBL part yeah, and sir. don't yeah, reconstruct absolutely. that femoral yeah. part. Put an end process of a proximal TBI and just suture the ligament. Absolutely. So, we can do that. We can do that. I, I think that is much better than putting yes, a yes, yes, to our distal femoral fibers. Yes, I so that... Not. I am not very happy in damaging a physis which is which we are planning to grow and whichever we are planning to I personally have never done that hemiprosthesis but I have seen the results and they are quite good. Sir, I, when I was there with at SNUS, they have done a case like that where they have just done a hemiprosthesis like hemi joint and they have yes, not exactly. reconstructed not, and not reconstructed any ligament and the patient is walking hinge prosthesis till the skeletal maturity is achieved. Yeah. Later on, this yes. can convert into a total joint. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Dr. Kim also wanted to add. 
something. Yes, yeah, I, I I definitely agree with Mr. Uh, Dr. Manish and Jamin, and I think age is one of the most important uh, issue in this case. When uh, the patient is adult, you know, considering the longevity and stability and everything, I think megaprosthesis would have advantage over you know biological reconstruction. But then, uh, when the patient is young or adolescent, we need uh, we can use biological reconstruction as a temporary um, procedure uh, when we move on to the you know permanent prosthesis. So uh, yes, I uh, when I was a fellow in Seoul National University, I've seen uh, multiple cases of hemiarthroplasty. That is also a good option for this case. But then. Uh, I wanted to add up that in case of proximal tibia, in compared to the distal femur, uh, hemiarthroplasty, it, it's a little bit more uh, difficult to get the uh, congruent joint using the uh, using the, the the insert. So that there are more cases of you know so, uh, somnoxation or dislocation compared to the distal femur. So can I again, Dr. Kim? Yeah. So the uh, results are exactly what we have seen. When I was at China for one month, they had very good results with upper tibia hemiprosthesis replacement rather than a distal femur hemiprosthesis. The limb length discrepancy that they observed with the proximal tibia hemiprosthesis were very less because you are preserving the distal femur physis, which is a major contributor. And they had a good uh, alignment with a proximal tibia rather than compared with the distal femur. Oh. So it's exactly reverse that what we expect that a upper tibia won't fare good, but it's it's exactly reverse. And they have published the data that upper tibia hemiprosthesis gives much more good results in terms of limb and discrepancy rather than a distal femur. What they used in distal femur is a smooth polished stem. They didn't ream that upper tibia. Just put in a uh, central hole and protect. Try to protect the tibial physis in case of distal femur. Mm -hmm. But that didn't help much in preventing limb and discrepancy. Sir, I would want to between uh, as we are running a little short on time now. Uh, uh, as Dr. Manish pointed out in the starting of our webinar regarding the quality and the process of this 3D printed implant in India. Sir, we have with us Mr. Mithun today who works for a 3D incredible company and he would want to share with us some details regarding the quality process and uh, uh, how the printing process is done at their lab in uh, India per se now. So I think Mithun, uh, we would want to listen to what you say now if you are available. Yes, sir. <laughs> Uh, yeah, Mithun, you start in, but just keep it little short. We are running a little short on time here. Uh, yes, sir. thank you. Thank you very much uh, for giving us the opportunity to uh, discuss on uh, how the 3D metal printed implant uh, manufactured and uh, and its quality process, uh, particularly in context of the India. Uh, so uh, to before starting, uh, I would like to uh, wish uh, the citizens of uh, South Korea and uh, the citizens of India a very happy Independence Day. And uh, I'll just start the presentation. I hope uh, the presentation uh, is visible to everyone. Yeah, yeah, you're visible. You can start. Okay. So, uh, 3D Incredible uh, is the Indian company uh, based out of Pune. Uh, we established uh, in 2017, our plant size is 14,000 square feet and we are the only company in India uh, which is uh, exclusively uh, ISO 13485 and ISO 9001 certified company for manufacturing of customized implant uh, using 3D metal printing process and uh, we are having state of the art and uh, uh, model facility which can handle uh, all complicated designs and structures. So in images, we can see we have the two metal uh, uh, printing machines, which are from the Rennie shop. Your, your, PPD, Mithun, your PPD is not working. I think you need to check that. Uh, yes, sir. Your slides are not coming. Yes, 
Is it visible, sir? Can you change the slides? So, can you see the slide, sir? Not yet. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we are the first company in India uh, to get ISO thirteen four eight five which is exclusively for medical 3D printing implant uh, manufacturing. Uh, we have PAN present, uh, India presence uh, with a strong distribution network uh, having more than 25 uh, to 30 distributors in India right now. We have won the award India SME uh, 100 award uh, by, uh, uh, awarded by the central government of India. Uh, we have done more than 400 such uh, completed cases uh, as of now uh, in uh, neurosurgery, oral maxillofacial, and on orthopedic. Uh, our plant layout is as per US, uh, sorry, Indian FDA uh, uh, approved layout and as per the European standard. The main core uh, is our designing department, which is in the biomedical engineers application. Uh, engineers and we are connected with the surgeons to uh, get such a robust designs. Uh, the core is our software is what we use for designing these, uh, uh, these complicated implants. So we use materialized Vemix and 3 matrix. Uh, these are the world's best USFDMC approved softwares. Apart from that, we do the FE analysis for every design. Uh, the process flow uh, is as uh, we can see on the slide. We need a CT scan and MRI, which we can superimpose both the data to recreate soft tissue and bony tissue uh, tumor uh, for the simulation. And uh, then we design uh, the implant. Uh, we decide the resection planes in consultation with uh, the respective surgeon uh, for the particular patient. Uh, once the uh, uh, resection planes uh, have been finalized, then we go for the designing of the implant and cutting jigs uh, or cutting and then it starts the manufacturing process where we uh, uh, prepare a build and we print it on the 3D printing machine for uh, uh, using 3D metal printing machine for implant and for anatomy model and uh, resection jigs uh, we use plastic printing machine. Uh, then, uh, post processing uh, we have quality control at every stage. Uh, we have class 10,000 clean rooms to handle uh, these implants uh, in a uh, control atmosphere and environment. Uh, once the quality control is done, uh, it is cleaned and packed uh, in a private packaging and it is dispatched to the uh, hospital for further sterilization process. So for CT scan, uh, we we need a 1 mm slice thickness CT scan and uh, so every stage, as I said, we have quality control uh, of uh, data. So for uh, at the time of uh, analyzing the CT scan and MRI, uh, we use various software to check the quality. Uh, if, if the quality is uh, as per the SOP, we proceed further for and uh, uh, creating the defect or segmentation of bone. So we use a materialized software to segment the bone. So in images, uh, we can see here. Uh, so, uh, we create the bony anatomy uh, with the segment uh, with minute and minute detail. Once it is done, uh, we dis discuss with with the concern respect uh, uh, So we have our own digital platform called Aptilia where we uh, discuss the design. Uh, also, we use the uh, video calling uh, option like Zoom or Skype for the planning. Once the resection planes are decided, then we proceed to the designing of the implant. 
So at resigning level, uh, we continuously interact with the surgeon uh, to incorporate all clinical aspects or the requirement from the surgeon side. Once the report from the surgeon, we proceed for the production. Before this, we do one very important stage is called finite element analysis. So this FE analysis, we do a software analysis for the design where it checks all uh, we put all parameters like the weight of the patient and professions, uh, uh, the flexion and other aspects which like required for the mechanical testing, which uh, all these testings we do in a software uh, and wherever we find the design is required correct. We do it. So this is how we make sure that uh, uh, the design or the, uh, the implant after manufacturing going to get risk factor, get uh, uh, evaluated and uh, removed at the time of designing. Uh, after this, uh, we prepare a build and we start printing process. So it takes uh, around 10 to 12 hours for the printing. Uh, as Dr. Kang said, the material is much more important. So we have uh, imported TI6L4 vanadium titanium alloy. Uh, uh, from the UK and we have done biocompatibility testing, mechanical testing, which is like a bed test, stress test, of uh, uh, then uh, uh, different fracture test and uh, we have demonstrated in uh, all tests that material is uh, very well biocompatible proven and uh, mechanically it is very strong as compared to the standards available implants from the other companies or since long time. Uh, during designing, we also discuss the different screw options, which is a uh, uh, very core and uh, USB. So, uh, 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 locking holes or combi holes, compression holes, and the factory for these uh, screws, uh, we decide and we simulate and we design. This is how we can see a 3D metal printing process happen. The, uh, the platform is going down and implant is manufactured layer by layer uh, in a video we can see. So uh, we have a DM, uh, DM uh, a printing process and it manufactured in a Z direction uh, and a high voltage laser is mounted on the top which Mithun, 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 your, your videos are not working. Okay. Is it is it is it now visible? No, it's just stuck on a design presentation. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So uh, we'll move on the further. Uh, the structure living is a high vacuum furnace. Uh, we use after three D printing uh, after printing. So the printing is very much complicated process and. We have validated every stage that we are the ISO 13485 only company in India right now for 3D metal printing uh, process. So after printing, uh, we uh, give the vac uh, uh, or a stress relieving process, uh, uh, furnace process. So we have vacuum furnace which uh, uh, works for a 10 to 13 hours we have created a protocol for this process uh, which release the stresses from the printing and make sure the uh, implant strong and stable uh, after that we have the post processing process so after uh, heat treatment we processing uh, depend on the uh, surface requirement like mirror finish where which is more very smooth and matte finish or rough finish we give the post processing. After that, uh, uh, we process the holes like locking holes as per the specifications, the various diameters of the screws to be used uh, during the surgery. And uh, we check roughness uh, of the of the surface during this process. Uh, in case of lattice structure, which is very important, uh, we have seen Dr. Kang have demonstrated a couple of designs where the lattice have been used very effectively and early. So this porousness and the lattice structure manufacturing required a lot of expertise and uh, we, 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 probably that we have uh, four lattice structure candidates uh, we can use as per the surgeon's requirement like particular structure or uh, variable thickness lattice structures or structure, TPMS structure. 
Uh, so these we can incorporate as and when required. Apart from that, we have different rough uh, structure surfaces along uh, apart from these lattice structures we can incorporate to have enhanced osteointegration uh, process uh, post surgery. Uh, this is how we check the quality control uh, at at, uh, uh, at uh, before the dispatching the implant or packaging. We do uh, quality control. Uh, help of advanced machines like CMM, uh, cockpit measurement machine, uh, then uh, the caliper, then uh, height gauge machine. I, wish, I, 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 I want to repeat, I, I think we are running too short on time. And, uh, Sir, I'm just uh, reaching the last slide. <laughs> it's yes, not working, yes. the presentation is not working. Okay, okay. So, can you see the, uh, uh, this is how we manufacture. So, uh, just in quickly uh, uh, answering to uh, Dr. Manish sir, uh, yes, uh, there is a cost effective and at par international quality uh, available, which is incredible uh, in India right now. And uh, I, I we will, would like to know the surgeons uh, to have valid solution for the detriment of uh, treatment of India and uh, we'll discuss in that also. So Dr. Manish or any other panelist, they want to ask something regarding this. Dr. Vivek. Just wanted to know how much is the turn down time once we order the implants now much time get it? Mithun, how much is the lead time? If you finish it. Mithun, I think Dr. Vivek asked you a question regarding how much is the time taken for you to give the implant? I missed it. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, no, Dr. Vivek, Mithun is not there. I think he's oh, the yes, doctor. We can call we can the later on. Uh -huh. Sir, I think we should now conclude. Can you hear me? Yeah, 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 Mithun, we can hear you. Yes, uh, it takes eight to eight, 10 to 15 days to deliver the implant. Uh, once we complete the designing part. So, designing is much more important uh, uh, what Dr. Uh, cancer explained. So we'll definitely uh, uh, have our own platform which will enhance the designing timings. And typically we have four to five days for the manufacture. So put together, uh, we can pro supply the implant in ten to fifteen days. Uh, even in India, sir. Thank you, okay. sir. I think we would want to conclude our webinar today, and I'm really thankful to all our esteemed valued speakers and the panelists for their in-depth thought and contribution on the innovation techniques used in orthopedic oncology these days. Hope this webinar uh, will provide some information on the new technologies available and their application in the clinical settings, thereby improving the survival outcomes for our bone cancer patients. We hope to take this webinar forward with continued collaboration from our friends from South Korea again in future. So, any word of comments from our uh, speakers and the panelists would be highly appreciated right no, now. It was a great learning lesson. Uh, in 3D printing, it should be a new field for us. So it would be great for us to collaborate with Professor Khan for our cases if he can uh, help us to develop this specialty. Uh, because uh, we are doing 3D printing cases, but it's still in very nascent phase. So it will be great for us if... Uh, will be a guide for us for 3D printing cases. Thank Dr. you. Manish. Thank you. Manish, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Himanshu. Thank you very much, Dr. Kang, Dr. Kim, for being Thank here. You, Actually, yeah, so we are very enlightened with your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Dr. Kang, Professor Kang, any comments? Yeah, um, the 3D printing design, I used to usually my cell phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, and then capture and design and send it to them. Oh. Um, today is very happy to me in the, on experience the situation of COVID-19. 
May all of us and our family be healthy. And bye bye until the next connection. Bye. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. okay. Have a good okay. day. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye bye. Bye bye. Think, think.